Good afternoon. This is Derek Olson, the president of World Oregon. It's an honor to have you here today with us for our virtual program on U.S.-Iran relations and the global pandemic. And in a moment, I'll be introducing uh, Dr. Paul Piller, who uh, is with the Iran Project, who are co-presenting this with. Um, those of you who are loyal attendees of our programs will remember we did uh, a program two or three years ago uh, with the Iran Project that was very well attended. And um, so it's great to partner with this organization. Um, again, as a reminder, this is a free webinar for World Oregon members. Uh, we appreciate your support during these challenging times. Um, and if you are not a World Oregon member, we'd ask that uh, after this uh, event, uh, you go to our website and consider joining at worldoregon.org. It's a special honor to have our speaker here today, and I'd love to introduce him now. Uh, Dr. Paul Piller retired in 2005 from a 28-year career in the U.S. intelligence community, in which his last position was National Intelligence Officer for the Near East and South Asia. Earlier, he served in a variety of analytical and managerial positions, including as Chief of Analytic Units at the CIA, covering portions of the Near East, Persian Gulf, and South Asia. He also served in the National Intelligence Council as one of the original members of its analytic group. He has been Executive Assistant to the CIA's Deputy Director for Intelligence and Executive Assistant to the Director of Central Intelligence, DCI, William Webster. He also headed the Assessments and Information Group of the Director of Central Intelligence Counterterrorist Center from 1997 to 1999. He was Deputy Chief of the Center. He was a Federal Executive Fellow at the Brookings Institution and is also a retired officer in the U.S. Army Reserve, served on active duty in 1971 to 73, including a tour of duty to Vietnam. Again, he is um, a leading expert with the Iran Project, with which we are uh, honored to produce this program. And without further ado, we're going to pass it over to our speaker, Dr. Pillar. Thanks very much, Derek, and hello to everyone. Uh, I, I would have certainly enjoyed an in-person visit out to Oregon, but uh, we'll make do with the electrons flying, even though uh, I, I wasn't flying. I'm gonna talk uh, first of all about uh, US policy uh, toward Iran. Um, and then how the Iranians have been reacting to it, and then talk some about the current situation inside Iran with regard to economics and public health and political trends. And finally, um, talk about some diplomatic issues that are just coming to the fore uh, and will be in the news in the next few weeks. If you go back, just to provide some context and background, go back over two years ago, uh, the principal mechanism that defined U.S.-Iranian relations was the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, JCPOA, uh, otherwise known as the Iranian nuclear deal, which was the agreement, uh, multilateral agreement, that placed severe restrictions on the Iranian nuclear program, introduced a comprehensive international inspection and monitoring regime on that program, and, and uh, uh, closed off through those means all possible paths uh, to an, an Iranian nuclear weapon. Uh, that agreement uh, went fully into force as of 2015. And so as of two years ago, it had already had a track record of three years of, uh, of monitoring by the International Atomic Energy Agency, which uh, confirmed that the Iranians were indeed complying with uh, their requirements under the agreement. Despite that compliance, the Trump administration two years ago uh, renounced the accord, uh, reneged on all the U.S. obligations under it, uh, and in fact had already begun violating some provisions of the agreement before that by discouraging other governments from conducting normal commerce uh, with the Iranians, which was to, uh, went against one, one of the clauses in the JCPOA. Despite that move by the Trump administration, the Iranians for an additional year from 2018 up until a year ago, the spring of last year, continued to comply uh, fully with their obligations, which was an indication of how deeply committed uh, the Iranian regime was and still is uh, to the agreement. Um, they had repeatedly made known that uh, they wanted to see full compliance with it. And if that wasn't gonna happen under the Trump administration, they would 
then basically wait it out and hope for a regime change uh, here in Washington um, you know, in another couple of years. The Iranians' patience ran out a year ago when the Trump administration escalated matters, went into uh, what is best described as unrestricted economic warfare against Iran, uh, aggressively using secondary sanctions to pressure uh, other governments as well as the private sector internationally from not having any commerce with the Islamic Republic of Iran and trying to bring uh, Iranian exports to zero. Uh, in response uh, to that, the Iranians have done basically two sets of things. One, they embarked on a, a set of carefully measured but progressive exceeding of the limits to their nuclear program under the JCPOA. These particularly involved limits to the amount of low enriched uranium that they could stockpile, as well as the amount of enrichment centrifuges that they could have operating at any one time. Uh, these measures have been um, very incremental, as I said, they are very reversible, which uh, is something that the Iranians have repeatedly emphasized, while saying that they would quite readily reverse them and come back into full compliance with the accord if and when the United States uh, complied with its obligations uh, as well. Uh, one of the main features of, of what they have done on the nuclear front is to increase the stockpile of low enriched uranium. Under the JCPOA, they were limited to no more than 300 kilograms of the stuff. Uh, at last count uh, by the IAEA, they now have something over 1,000 kilograms. For those people who look at such things in terms of so-called breakout time, uh, should uh, the Iranians uh, choose to try to build a nuclear weapon, most of the estimates talk about uh, as a result of this increase in the LEU stockpile, going from somewhere around a year of breakout time to something more like six months, which is still more than the two months or so that was the prevailing estimate uh, before the JCPOA was signed and the Iranians had to do the reduction and breakdown of their program under the agreement. There is no indication, I quickly add, that the Iranians are uh, wanting or trying to build a nuclear weapon. Uh, what they are instead doing is using this uh, increase in their nuclear activity as a bargaining chip, basically the same way they were using it when the JCPOA was under negotiation uh, more than five years ago, a way of countering maximum pressure with pressure of their own. Uh, the other thing that the Iranians uh, have done is to be uh, more aggressive uh, with military means uh, in the region. And specifically, we've seen things over this last year uh, that we hadn't seen before, uh, particularly attacks that uh, bring into play the oil trade as it relates to uh, the Arab Gulf producers on the other side of the Persian Gulf. There was the sabotage of several tankers in the Gulf of Oman, and then the most uh, spectacular and impressive move uh, was an attack with some combination of cruise missiles and drones last fall against a couple of Saudi oil facilities, the Quraysh oil field and the Abqaiq uh, uh, processing center, which is a, a key uh, center in, in the Saudi Arabian oil uh, operation. Um, this was a precision attack, which uh, impressed a lot of people, surprised some people in terms of uh, the precision with which it was carried out. The Iranians have been doing nothing like that uh, before the US uh, reneging on the JCPOA. And they had always been, up until that point, uh, particularly cautious about fooling around with the oil trade uh, and doing that kind of attack on a Saudi facility, knowing full well that this might get into uh, an escalatory spiral in which their own oil facilities and exports would be endangered, which of course would be very bad news for them. But once the Trump administration decided to try to destroy the Iranian oil trade anyway, uh, that obviously greatly changed their calculations. The attack on the Saudi facilities was also intended surely to send a message to the Saudis in particular, but also to the other Gulf Arabs as to what sort of dangers they would run uh, if through whatever 
escalatory uh, me, uh, channel this might happen, a shooting war were to break out between the Iranians and the United States and anyone else. It was a way of, to use Western security jargon, uh, establishing deterrence. Another part of the background of this is that the Iranian uh, leadership, uh, ever since the Trump administration embarked on what they did a year ago, has said more than once that basically if we, Iran, cannot export our oil, then uh, other competing exporters uh, in the region shouldn't be expected to be able to freely export their oil as well. And one could interpret the attack last fall as uh, trying to make that point. There have been some other actions of a kinetic and violent sort, uh, particularly inside Iraq, some of which have involved some of the militia groups there. Uh, but most of those uh, can be described as tit for tat reprisals for things that the United States did. And the most aggressive thing in that theater that anyone's done was the US assassination of Qasem Soleimani, the head of the uh, Revolutionary Guard Quds Force, uh, when he was in Iraq um, and he was killed in a rocket attack um, uh, from a US drone that also killed a senior uh, Iraqi security official while they were at the Baghdad airport. Uh, it's hard to overstate just how significant a figure Soleimani was. Uh, it went far beyond his position as head of the Quds Force, one of the elements within the Revolutionary Guard. He was a major political as well as a military figure who had a very high profile and much popularity inside Iran, as reflected by the fact that uh, when he, his funeral took place, uh, Western correspondents estimated at least a million people turning out in the streets in Tehran, and that was just in Tehran. There were other similar uh, outpourings in the streets of several other Iranian uh, cities. Um, Inside Iran today, the, the economic picture uh, obviously is very grim. Uh, Iranian economic mismanagement has something to do with this, uh, but the US uh, economic warfare is the single biggest uh, factor. And now you have uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, which has made things uh, significantly even worse. Before the pandemic uh, uh, struck Iran, the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, was uh, putting out some estimates that suggested uh, the contraction of the Iranian economy that's taken place these last couple of years might actually stop in 2020 and by the end of the year uh, resume at least a small amount of growth. Uh, COVID-19 has obviously um, uh, made that kind of estimate grossly obsolete by some other estimates I've seen in just the first couple of months in which the virus uh, hit Iran uh, the GDP of Iran has probably contracted another 15% uh, or so. Uh, COVID-19, uh, as, you, as you are aware, hit Iran especially hard early in the pandemic. It was one of the first uh, early hotspots outside of China. Uh, when the first confirmed cases came up in Iran in about the second week in February, uh, one of the major difficulties the Iranians had in dealing with it was an absence of testing. We've heard of a lot about that issue, of course, in our country as well. Well, the, the Iranians were really flying blind. That was related to the difficulty in getting you know, necessary supplies and materials, uh, which in turn is related uh, to, to the sanctions that the US has imposed. Another kind of indirect way in which the sanctions have figured into how the pandemic hit Iran early on is the fact that that U.S. policy has made the Iranian relationship with China all the more important to Iran, and the Iranian leaders were thus very reluctant uh, to curtail travel and commerce between Iran and China. That almost certainly had a major effect in spreading the virus uh, from China to hit uh, Iran as one of the, one of the earliest um, uh, victims. Beyond that, uh, there were other things that had nothing to do with sanctions where the Iranians did some things right and other things uh, not, not very well at all. Uh, they closed the schools fairly early, but they did not close down mosques and religious activities. Uh, it would have been a source of resistance by the religious establishment if they had. That obviously was a major spreader of the virus, especially given that the, the holy city of Qum uh, was one of the real hot spots within Iran, and they continue to have seminary students, others moving in and out of Qum, which also uh, 
badly spread the virus inside the country. Iran's part of the pandemic, because they got hit so early, um, has peaked before a lot of other countries, certainly before it's peaked here in the United States. At the last official count, uh, there were something like 115,000 cases, most of which have already covered, a bit have recovered, and about 6,800 deaths. But those numbers almost certainly grossly underestimate both the infection rate and the mortality rate inside Iran, partly for the same reason that the estimates are low in many other countries, and namely the uh, inadequacy of testing. And Iran still continues to be on a per capita basis, even farther behind the curve than the US is on testing. Um, you may have seen Nicholas uh, Kristof in the, Washington, in the uh, New York Times had in his column today, a piece that explained how the US uh, death toll is probably already over 100,000 because of the, uh, how it goes beyond just the, the number of confirmed deaths. Well, in Iran, that sort of discrepancy between the official figures and the actual deaths are pro is probably even greater. Uh, the U.S. sanctions have had other effects on the COVID situation in Iran besides uh, the ones that I mentioned. Uh, there continue to be shortages of material and supplies uh, that uh, come from overseas that the Iranians simply cannot get. Uh, and partly in response to this, there have been multiple appeals ranging from uh, the Prime Minister of Pakistan to various NGOs, uh, to uh, most recently, just a couple of weeks ago, um, an open letter signed by a couple of dozen former cabinet level um, officials, both in Europe and the United, St United States, appealing to the Trump administration to relax the sanctions on Iran, um, at least temporarily, for the sake of uh, letting them deal with the COVID-19 situation a little bit better. And as that letter pointed out, uh, this has indirect effects on all of our health since to the extent that any one country, whether it's Iran or anyone else, has difficulty bringing their part of the pandemic under control. That makes the whole global situation as far as controlling the pandemic is concerned uh, that much worse. And that ultimately with a virus that does not respect international boundaries can come back to bite us. The Trump administration's response to all this has been basically to rebuff it and to uh, note that uh, food and medicine, humanitarian supplies of that nature are exempt from the sanctions, which on paper is true. However, that overlooks a couple of other things. Uh, for one thing, as far as COVID-19 is concerned, some of the other subsidiary materials like uh, personal protective uh, equipment, the PPE we've heard so much about here in our country, uh, is not all exempt from the sanctions. But the most important thing is uh, stuff can't be imported, whether it's humanitarian material or anything else, uh, if you don't have the means to uh, uh, strike uh, commercial transactions and, and finance it. And here's where the continuing very severe financial sanctions, which are very much still in effect, uh, uh, prevent trade in humanitarian or uh, non-humanitarian channels. Uh, put quite simply, uh, the U.S. Treasury has put the scare of God into the private sector, including businesses and financial institutions, particularly in Europe, uh, which are frightened uh, and don't want to do anything that risks even inadvertently running afoul of Treasury and thereby being penalized and losing their access to US markets. So the easiest thing for the private sector to do is just not do any business with Iran at all. And so even though there are these formal exemptions uh, for some aspects of uh, humanitarian material, uh, they still aren't getting them. And one indication, well actually two indications of this, has been the performance of a couple of channels that were set up with specifically with humanitarian trade in mind. One was a channel that the Europeans started putting together after the US uh, uh, reneged on JCPOA two years ago, which the Europeans have called INSTEX. They've, they've had a hard time getting it going, mainly because of this private sector resistance I've talked about. Uh, and finally, it's, it's sort of come into operation, but there's basically been just one transaction so far. And then there was another channel which the United States was involved in setting up with the aid of the Swiss and the administration actually made kind of a big deal about it, which was established back in January, specifically for humanitarian 
aid uh, focused on, on medical matters. There was one pilot transaction in January, but since then there hasn't been a single shipment uh, under this channel either. Uh, so in short, the financial uh, sanctions are still um, having their effect despite the formal exemptions for humanitarian aid. The Trump administration officials obviously know all this, uh, even though they don't you know, point publicly to the factors that I've just pointed out. The administration goal has always been rather unclear. You know, there's been the talk about getting a better deal on nuclear matters, but the only thing that sort of formally gets put down is something like a set of a dozen demands that Secretary of State Pompeo enunciated some time ago, uh, which were, well, let me put it this way. They reminded me of the demands that Austria-Hungary levied on Serbia in July 1914 with the intention not that they'd be accepted, but that they'd be rejected. Uh, to the extent that regime change is the real goal, and I think it is for people like Mr. Pompeo, uh, the suffering of ordinary Iranians uh, from whatever combination of economic and public health problems beset them is, is fine, as long as it increases the prospect in their minds, that is to say in, in the thinking of someone like the Secretary of State, that um, uh, this increases the chances of some sort of popular uprising that would uh, topple the current Iranian regime. And so the administration sees COVID-19 far from being an, uh, an occasion to ease up on sanctions, rather uh, an opportunity to make the pressure hurt all the more. Uh, in this connection, the dream of regime change, especially regime change of a sort that uh, would produce a, a replacement that would be better from our point of view and not even worse than what we have in Tehran now, is really pretty much only that, a dream. Uh, there have been many times in the last four decade history of the uh, Islamic Republic of Iran where this sort of thing has been said, that you know, a little more pressure and this whole thing is going to come tumbling down and it never seems to happen. There certainly is popular dissatisfaction, indeed a lot of it, among ordinary Iranians with how the regime has performed, especially economically. Uh, but there's also an awareness among most Iranians um, who are smart enough to realize the role of U.S. sanctions in what they're suffering right now. And besides, there's just simply no viable opposition movement that is waiting in the wings, ready to take over. And at a time of the COVID-19 pandemic, don't expect uh, large street demonstrations that would have some kind of revolutionary effect. Meanwhile, uh, as far as the politics inside Iran are concerned, the main effect of the U.S. maximum pressure campaign uh, has been to bolster the position of the hardliners, including those associated with the Revolutionary Guard Corps, at the expense of elements in the regime that we would describe more as pragmatist, pragmatist or moderate. Uh, President Rouhani, because of the extent to which uh, he's been identified with the JCPOA, became discredited uh, when the U.S. renounced it. Uh, so he's been on the defensive ever since then. The hardliners have been saying all through these last two years, we told you so. You shouldn't have negotiated with the perfidious Americans because look how they will double-cross you. The Supreme Leader Ali Khamenei, although he gave Rouhani and Foreign Minister Zarif enough slack to negotiate the agreement and was willing to identify with it to the extent and as long as it was successful, uh, gave himself enough slack to be able to take that same line himself now about uh, the hazards of negotiating with the untrustworthy Americans. And as far as the effect of the sanctions are concerned, uh, the Revolutionary Guard Corps part of the economy has actually fared not as badly as much of the overall private sector in Iran has for a number of reasons, including that uh, to the extent that smuggling and sanctions busting is going on, the Revolutionary Guard probably has pretty much of a corner on that. And now, especially with COVID-19 added to the mix, uh, many Iranians have become more dependent than ever on the government-related charitable foundations known as banyads, particularly associated with the Supreme Leader. Uh, in short, uh, there is a day-to-day -day dependence on the regime uh, that would make many Iranians uh, scared of trying to uh, rock the boat and make their day-to-day -day life even more difficult than it has already become. 
I'd like to finish up with uh, talking about a couple of diplomatic uh, channels, or not channels, but um, really uh, forays that the administration is, uh, has cooked up and that will be matters in the news both now and over the next uh, few weeks. One concerns the arms embargo. Um, this, there was a provision in the JCPOA uh, that said uh, the conventional arms embargo, which was part of the multilateral sanctions that had been levied on Iran, uh, would expire five years after the uh, agreement went into force. That means later this year. The administration has said quite a bit about this, uh, saying they want the arms embargo to continue. This talk, this refers to both the selling and the buying, uh, the importing and the exporting of arms if it involves Iran. One important part of the background of this to bear in mind is uh, the reason why this was part of a nuclear agreement. We're talking about conventional arms here. Well, the, the conventional arms embargo was simply one more way of sanctioning Iran to try to induce it to do what it eventually did, was to, which was to negotiate uh, limitations on its nuclear program. It didn't reflect some you know, independent uh, uh, design with regard to conventional arms per se, independent of the nuclear issue. So that really meant you know, once Iran signed on to what it signed on to with the JCPOA, um, the logical thing would have been for the arms embargo to come off right away, but the United States insisted through the negotiations that at least get delayed, and hence we came up with this five-year thing. Um, the U.S. Uh, is going to push this in the United Nations Security Council. Um, it would be very hard for the U.S. to make the kind of case that's going to stand up that would say, well, Iran ought to be singled out much more than anyone else in the region. I mean, just for comparison, for example, uh, their rival, Saudi Arabia, on the other side of the Gulf, uh, imports, as you know, enormous amounts of U.S. arms. Uh, according to the agreements that are currently on the books, uh, the Saudis are slated to import 350 billion, that's over a third of a trillion dollars worth of arms, just from the U.S. over the next 10 years. And the Saudis have been using conventional arms to do things like um, conduct the air war in Yemen and turn that into a humanitarian disaster. Uh, other members of the Security Council, and especially Russia and China, have indicated they are opposed to this, and the Russians have been quite explicit about it. So we can expect that uh, if the U.S. pushes this, there will be at least a Russian and probably a Chinese veto. And then the next step, and again, the U.S. administration has been quite clear what its overall plan is on this, would be to turn from that to try to, uh, to exercise the so-called snapback provision that was also part of the JCPOA. And this was this uh, ingeniously devised uh, clause that was a way in which um, the then Obama administration uh, <clears throat> tried to reassure skeptics about the agreement that if the Iranians started violating their obligations under the JCPOA, <clears throat> that the sanctions would quickly be reinstituted without uh, facing the uh, threat of a veto from the likes of the Russians and Chinese to prevent that from happening. So the agreement basically says if any of the other parties, such as the US, declares uh, that the Iranians are in violation and that the sanctions that were against them before ought to snap back, that will happen unless the Security Council takes a new positive vote on a new resolution. And of course, the um, US could always veto anything it doesn't like. Well, the, the obvious problem with this is uh, the United States isn't a participant anymore in the JCPOA. Uh, the action it took two years ago, uh, the administration was quite clear, we're out, we're through. We have no, want nothing to do with this agreement. We're, we're signing our, we're, we're not a participant anymore. Whereas the snapback provisions explicitly says this is something that participants uh, can do. Well, the administration has had to put together some pretty ingenious uh, reasoning to try to say that they're still eligible to um, enact the snapback provision, despite what I just said. Uh, they talk about how, well, it's really the UN resolution, Resolution 2231, 
uh, rather than the JCPOA itself that someone has to participate in. And that overlooks the fact that Resolution 2231 was basically the Security Council's blessing of the JCPOA and calls on all parties, including the US, to obey the JCPOA. I saw something the other day uh, from Brian Hook, who is the administration's point man on pressuring Iran and has to be making this case. And uh, one line that stood out was Mr. Hook said, well, nothing in Resolution 2231 uh, explicitly said the US couldn't do this. And it, it, it never defined participant as someone who's participating. Well, okay. Um, Needless to say, the other parties to the agreement uh, don't accept this line of reasoning, to put it mildly. The Russians use the word ludicrous. Uh, so if the US does indeed press this channel, and they might be aided if, say, whoever holds the presidency of the UN Security Council is some small state uh, whose arm could be twisted by Washington, uh, and by the way, I think the, well, the, the current uh, council president is Estonia. A couple of the states that are in line to hold the presidency of the council over the next six months are Niger and St. Vincent and the Grenadines. So the possibility I just mentioned is indeed uh, something that might happen. But if it does happen, we'd have essentially a constitutional crisis in the UN Security Council, the likes of Russia and China would ignore uh, what the U.S. was trying to do would probably um, proceed to do conventional arms sales uh, as they see fit. Uh, the Security Council's authority would be um, badly damaged, and certainly there would be very strong resistance, not just by the Iranians, but anyone else, to anything like the snapback provision being placed in an agreement again, given the way the U.S. Uh, was trying to use it. Well, this being the case and facing the kind of impasse that uh, we face with these issues, uh, I think over the next several months or at least until next January, um, we're not gonna get out of this uh, confrontation um, uh, any way that I can see. And meanwhile, there is, uh, because it is a confrontation with high tensions, always uh, running the risk of uh, something spinning out of control and uh, going to a wider war. I don't think either side wants that now. The Iranians certainly don't, and I don't believe President Trump does either, but there are various ways in which it could come about. One would be accident, uh, some incident perhaps in the Persian Gulf that gets out of control. Uh, we've come close to that before. Uh, you might remember there was the incident back during the Obama administration uh, when a couple of small U.S. Navy craft uh, ventured into U.S., or excuse me, ventured into Iranian territorial waters. Apparently it was a mistake. They, their navigational gear was malfunctioning. And the Iranians did what we, of course, would do if Iranian vessels ventured into our territorial waters. They seized the, the vessels and the crew. Fortunately, we had a channel of communications at the foreign minister level as a byproduct of the negotiations over the JCPOA. John Kerry got on the phone to Javad Zarif uh, work things out, and we got our vessels and our crew back in 24 hours. Uh, I worry about what would happen if the same sort of incident occurred now when there's no such channel of communications, and the situation with regard to the overall relationship is much different. And as a reminder of how accidents happen, uh, there's certainly been accidents on the Iranian side. Uh, you had the accidental shoot down of the Ur Ukrainian airliner, uh, some weeks back. And then just four days ago, uh, Iranian naval forces in the Persian Gulf had a friendly fire incident in which one of their vessels fired on a, another of their own vessels and killed 19 Iranian sailors and injured a number of others. I mean, fortunately, that didn't spin out of control. But you can see uh, and imagine easily ways in which accidents uh, uh, could go in a different direction. Another possibility is, is miscalculation by either the United States or Iran in terms of what the limits are to what the other side would tolerate in pressing the envelope uh, with perhaps uh, you know, use of force either directly or by proxies. And in this regard, we should remember that from the Iranian point of view, they've still got a totally unsatisfactory situation with regard to uh, the US trying to uh, totally crush their economy and their oil trade. And finally, there are the sorts of wild cards uh, such as perhaps uh, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu uh, 
uh, if he faced especially the prospect of maybe a Democratic president coming into the White House next January, uh, trying to stir things up um, uh, to ignite something that would uh, spoil relationships, uh, even at the expense of igniting a shooting war. Or, and I don't think this is likely, but you can't rule it out, even President Trump, to the extent that um, uh, the economic and public health situation in this country may get worse, uh, uh, trying a wag the dog type uh, distracting scenario that involves the higher risk of war with Iran. Uh, with that, Derek, I'll stop and uh, I welcome uh, discussion and your questions. Great, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Piller. This is Tim DeRoche, Director of Programs for World Oregon. We've got some good questions coming in, keep them coming. Uh, let's start with, um, does, does the current U.S. administration have anyone on the policy level with a moderate, broad, and balanced knowledge of the complexity of Iran-U.S. relations that could inform decision-making beyond what I would say is a current uh, hostile posturing? Well, I'm sure there's, uh, you know, knowledge within the bureaucracy. I mean, the intelligence community, which I came out of, uh, uh, you know, as follows these things, although there I think we've got some questions raised as to what's going on at the top of the community and to what extent um, insights that may be offered from farther below ever make it up to the uh, decision making levels. And, you know, th these are smart people, even if uh, you or I or someone else might criticize where they're going as far as policy direction is concerned. You know, Mike Pompeo is not dumb. He's smart. He knows what he's doing. And I would think Brian Hook, uh, who has been uh, assigned to be seized with this issue, even if he's forced to make, you know, somewhat contorted lines of argument about things like the snapback issue that I described, uh, he's no dummy either. So I don't think it's a matter of... Um, you know, not getting the insights. It's, it's a matter of, of political will. And it really goes back, I mean, I don't want to get too, too political and partisan about this or, or sound that way, but uh, you have to ask, you know, why did, why did the Trump administration go in this direction to begin with? And I think it really gets back, back to a, a larger orientation of undoing whatever the previous administration did. And in that case, the JCPOA, uh, has filled, uh, I think, in Mr. Trump's mind um, and in the minds of many others, the same role in foreign policy that the Affordable Care Act filled domestically. That is to say, you know, the, probably the most significant and maybe the best uh, achievement of, of the Obama administration uh, in each of those two areas. And for that reason alone, it was regarded as something that had to be killed and, and um, and, and that they, they didn't want to have to, anything to do with. Uh, when, and when that's your starting point, then it's hard to come up with any kind of information, insight, or expertise that's, that's going to undo things and uh, set the administration on a different direction. So here's another question coming in. Uh, you're describing a fairly negative view of the current administration policy regarding Iran. But what are your thoughts about the administration policies during the Bush era? And then as a sort of follow-up, um, it's a question about the inability of inspectors to verify proper compliance of the Iranian regime to the terms of agreement, or at least as they've been, uh, the, or the shortcomings of that as been reported by the media. Do you have thoughts there? Sure. Um, as far as the George W. Bush administration is concerned, I think, uh, you know, the one issue there is the judgments that were made about what would be, uh, the bargaining space and what would be uh, acceptable at all uh, to the Iranians as far as a, a formula for restricting their nuclear program was concerned. And, and the basic issue there was, would the Iranians ever agree to zero enrichment, to take away totally uh, their ability to enrich uranium? Uh, under the Bush administration, the policy was, we don't it's zero enrichment. We don't want to let them have anything. And if we're going to reach any agreement with them, it's going to be on the basis of zero enrichment. And that simply didn't fly. Um, and it was only until after uh, the next administration made the decision, okay, zero enrichment isn't going to work. We have to find ways 
uh, in which the Iranians are going to be allowed some kind of enrichment, but place so many restrictions on it and do so many other things with regard to international inspection and monitoring that we can be confident that all possible avenues to an Iranian nuke have been closed. So I, I think that's, that's the one uh, area I would immediately talk about. But I would you have, I have to quickly mention a second thing under the George W. Bush administration. Going back to the first months after 9-11, I'm talking about late 2001 and into the first uh, month or so of 2002, there was a real opportunity uh, to greatly improve the U.S.-Iranian relationship, especially centering around cooperation between the two governments on Afghanistan. Uh, there was a lot of cooperation. Um, at the level of, at the ambassadorial level in particular, uh, James Dobbins was the principal uh, U.S. envoy who was directly involved in this, and he could tell you uh, about this in detail. Uh, after 9-11 and when, um, after we went in with Operation Enduring Freedom in Afghanistan starting in November of 2001 and overthrew the, uh, the Taliban regime that had then been in power, uh, then there was excellent cooperation between the U.S. and the Iranians in uh, midwifing uh, a new uh, Afghan government, which turned out to be the government of Hamid Karzai. And the, the Iranians quite uh, unsurprisingly uh, got their hopes up that this could be the turning over of a, a big new leaf in US-Iranian relations. That all came to a screeching halt when just a few weeks later in the State of the Union address in 2002, President Bush declared his axis of evil in which he lumped Iran in with Iraq and North Korea as, as evil states we didn't want to have anything to do with. So, so there were missed opportunities there. On the second question, uh, you know, with regard to um, being able to keep track of Iranian activities and what's in the media, the, the main issue that's been raised, and it's a legitimate issue, but I don't think we ought to overstate its importance, has to do with past activities and to what extent the Iranians have come totally clean about things they were doing in the past. In the past, the Iranians were doing work on a nuclear weapon, um, on, on design and uh, things that uh, went beyond just enrichment of fissile material. The best information we have and the judgments that have been made public from the U.S. intelligence community are uh, that that work uh, stopped uh, back around 2003. Um, and since then, there's been no indication that anything like that uh, has resumed. The Iranians made a basic decision going into negotiating the JCPOA that it would be better for them uh, to be a non-nuclear weapon state that get, gets reintegrated back into the uh, world economy than to be a nuclear weapon state that is punished and isolated forever as a pariah. Um, that's a reversible decision too, depending on how they're treated um, uh, now. Um, but but I, I think in terms of the, uh, the monitoring, if you don't get too hung up on having to tell all the tales of the past and instead focus on the present and the future, which is really what the IAEA monitoring is all about and what I think it ought to be about, uh, then I think we can be pretty darn confident that, that uh, we've got the sort of uh, monitoring uh, regime that we need, which includes not only the on-site regular uh, inspection of the declared facilities, but also, and this is all written in detail in the JCPOA, provisions for challenge inspections of undeclared facilities, provisions that make it possible that even if the Iranians tried to resist this, ultimately they'd be outvoted by the other participants uh, in the agreement, and they would have to open up a facility that was uh, being raised as a, as a place of suspicion. So <clears throat> we've got a supreme leader, <clears throat> pardon me, we've got a supreme leader who is aging. Um, Rouhani will be terming out. And looking at the future of leadership for the Islamic Republic, is there any speculation that somebody like Javad Zarif, <clears throat> U.S. educated foreign minister, widely respected globally, you mentioned him earlier, He's been labeled as a, quote, illegitimate spokesperson for Iran by the U.S. Could somebody like him have designs on leadership or presidency after Rouhani turns out? Uh, I would be very um, bearish about the career prospects right now of Javad Zarif. You know, as, as favorable as that would be from the U.S. point of view if he, uh, say, became the president, uh, given 
uh, his understanding of us, our understanding of him, the excellent lines of communication that were established during the, the previous administration. Um, I, I think he, he is even more so than Rouhani uh, been discredited in the, in the way that I mentioned earlier because of what has happened to the JCPOA uh, since, since the Trump administration uh, started its policy two years ago. So I, I really don't see him going anywhere. Um, I would I would go back to my earlier generalization that hardliners in general uh, are on the political upswing and moderates and pragmatists on the downswing in Iran. And that plays into both uh, who will be the next president, Rouhani is currently in his second term, can't run again, and who will uh, become the next supreme leader uh, after Amine. On that one, you know, that's a lot, it's a very fuzzy future. Some people have talked about maybe even the, the position of supreme leader will be uh, modified that you would have uh, maybe some kind of council or triumvirate or something that might replace him rather than having a single leader. I think that's all yet to be decided uh, in discussion and debate inside Tehran. But, but overall, I, I don't see a reversal of the drift toward the hardliners anytime soon. And, and if you're talking about real changes that really would qualify as regime change, uh, the most likely thing uh, would be in a direction less favorable from our point of view than what we have now. And I, I would think it would be something more akin to a revolutionary guard military dictatorship than anything else. So on this subject of regime change, if we think about the fact that 60% of Iran's 80 million people are under 30 years old, uh, how is this demographic engaged in the current political culture of Iran? And is there any prevailing sense that regime change could come from within and from the bottom up? I think most of the people, including the younger generations you refer to, are just, they're, they're trying to get by or get out. Um, there is not the mood for making a revolution or for uh, um, staking out political careers that would have change that would be meaningful in, in, in our eyes. Uh, I think a lot of other things would have to happen first before you would have um, making a major effect, the Iranian equivalent of, say, the, uh, the ambitious young people who come to Washington and try to uh, uh, make careers as in and outers of government that have a real effect. And eventually, you know, several years later, a couple of administrations later, they wind up in senior policy making positions. There may, there are no doubt are some Iranians, you know, under 30 who have those sorts of dreams, but I, I think for the great majority of them, um, it's, it's getting by this month and this year and uh, getting their personal lives in, in a way that they can, um, well, getting them in order and not having larger political dreams of, of, of the sort that you're talking about. So if there is a different president in the U.S. come 2021, what would it take for Iran to come back to the nuclear table and what would be their incentive to do that? Well, the, the, the basic step that would have to be taken, and uh, Joe Biden, as well as some of what had been the previous uh, uh, Democratic candidates who were opposing him for the presidency, have said is uh, get back in compliance with the JCPOA. Now, that's not the end of the story, but it's got to be the first chapter of the story. Um, and and that, would, uh, that would go a long ways to get us to, to a better relationship. Now, you know, the JCPOA was never going to be the whole story. And um, it, you know, set the table for not only follow on agreements that address nuclear issues, but to um, develop some a working relationship and, and trust that comes from complying with one's agreements that would enable uh, US and Iranian uh, leaders and negotiators to address other issues of concern, and possibly even reach formal agreements, or if not that, reach some better understandings that would uh, mean less of a risk of war and, and uh, something much different from the confrontation we've seen. Um, there, if, if you had a President Biden and then one of his early steps was to say, okay, we're back in the JCPOA, we're going to go back to where we were uh, prior to May uh, 2018, well, the Iranians would say, well, thank you, glad you're finally living up to your obligations. Um, we'd be happy to sort of readmit you to the, the Joint Commission, which is the body that, uh, in which all the participants of the JCPOA uh, participate and discuss uh, matters of compliance and other, any other issues that come up. And then you'd take it from there. Uh, 
Uh, now, it would be a very early issue uh, as to all right, what's, what sort of follow-on agreements do we need, uh, particularly because, as many have noted, uh, you've got, besides that conventional arms embargo that I talked about, you've got other provisions in the JCPOA that have various uh, schedules or, or um, sunset clauses attached to them. Um, if we hadn't had the wastage of time that we've had now, you know, over the last three years and not making any progress in the relationship, we probably would have already uh, been addressing these sorts of things, having preliminary discussions about possibly a follow-on nuclear agreement, a more for more thing where um, we would uh, get some farther reaching restrictions in return for which the Iranians would get some more sanctions relief or whatever. Uh, I mean, that would be the subject of more detailed negotiations, but it really has to start with step one, which is uh, come back in compliance with what we all already agreed to, which is the JCPOA. So uh, Tim Horgan, our colleague from the World Affairs Council in New Hampshire, wants to know the best way forward in the U.S.-Iran relationship and what local communities can do to push the U.S. towards that end, to which I would add, what is the role of expat um, Iranian slash Persian communities in that dialogue between the U.S. and Iran? Well, I think what I would emphasize both with the expat communities and, and also with the general message that, you know, local elements, whether in New Hampshire or anywhere else could emphasize is um, reducing the risk of, of a wider war. Um, and I think it would be emphasizing, uh, you know, to President Trump that he came into office uh, saying things about we've had too many wars in the Middle East, we've been overextended, you know. Um, well, uh, if you don't want to get into another uh, even bigger problem than, say, the Iraq war was, then you've got to do some things to reduce the risk of a wider war coming out of this current high tension dead end that we're in with the Iranians. And um, maximum pressure just isn't going to do it. Uh, a, a change, of course, is necessary. And I, I think putting it in the terms of that, that one hopes even a Donald Trump could relate to, uh, not wanting a, another war. And I would also add, as long as we've got the COVID-19 problem, the point that the, uh, the former officials mentioned in their joint letter, that this, this reflects on our health and, and affects us. You can't just um, you know, wish ill on one other country that's dealing with the same virus and expect that it won't come back and, and, and bite us. So, so themes like that, the, the, the health and the safety of the American people and keeping the United States out of war, I think would be ones that a, uh, everyone ought to be able to agree with. So one of the reasons Trump claims that we withdrew from the agreement was the Iranian adventurism in the area and the continual threat to Israel, among others, was not addressed in the agreement. Has the administration's actions helped curtail or exacerbate Iranian actions in the area, in particular Syria, Hezbollah, and Hamas? Well, I, I, I tried to address that before. And I think the clear answer is they've exacerbated them. If you just look at you know, what the activity has been over the last couple of years, especially the last one year since maximum pressure really became maximum, uh, it's been substantially worse uh, than it was before, um, to the extent there's any change at all. Um, and I you know, mentioned the, the attacks in the Gulf area, which we, we weren't seeing anything like that before. We also weren't seeing, um, you know, rocket attacks on uh, Iraqi bases uh, where U.S. personnel are. That sort of, it just wasn't happening. Now, the Iranians, uh, you know, they have a regional policy. They've been very active. Their relationship with uh, Syria, you know, goes back uh, decades. It's the one um, major Arab alliance they've had that they've sort of been able to rely on. So it's very important to them. And that's the sort of thing that hasn't gone up or has gone down. Uh, you know, one of the real uh, fictions here that, that you hear in the rhetoric quite a bit tries to couple all this to the sanctions relief and say, well, you know, they got, they got more money and so they have more money to spend on nefarious destabilizing activity in the region. Well, you know, if that were true, then we should have seen an upsurge of that kind of activity uh, after 2015 when the JCPOA went into effect. And we should have seen a down uh, slope in that activity 
when the Trump administration reimposed even heavier sanctions. It hasn't worked that way at all. And if anything, it's been the exact opposite. So could you clarify or characterize the, the sort of taffy pull tension between Iran and Saudi Arabia? And I'm curious also if COVID-19 could somehow be the thing that moves us beyond the proxy war of Yemen. Uh, I don't, well, COVID-19 might help in that respect. I, I think what would help in even more of a respect is realization um, on both sides, but especially in Saudi Arabia, because that's, you know, they've been the more aggressive actor here. Uh, of, of the dangers of, of a wider war. And in that respect, I think, you know, that, that attack on, on the Saudi oil facilities last fall, um, as much as it ought to concern us uh, on every other score, it probably did have some of its intended effect of uh, establishing deterrence and scaring the Saudi leadership. And we're mainly talking about the young prince uh, Mohammed bin Salman, uh, who is running the show now, uh, into thinking more about, ooh, if things spin out of control here, uh, we could be in really big trouble. Uh, this was just a taste of what the Iranians uh, were able to do against some of our critical oil facilities. And I think it's uh, not unconnected, uh, that and uh, the, the measures that MSB has, uh, MBS, I'm sorry, has taken more recently uh, to try to extract himself from, from the Yemeni war. Uh, now, his uh, would-be allies in the United Arab Emirates have uh, taken more of the lead on this, and he's been left more alone. But uh, there's been more of a willingness to uh, de-escalate in general the overall rivalry in that part of the world, and that includes the Yemen Yemeni war. Uh, so, so I think uh, just, a sober realization of the risks and how things could get even worse uh, can be the formula for easing some of these tensions. We ought to bear in mind, you know, there's a history of, 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 de, of not just demarches, but of, of a detente um, between uh, Iran and Saudi Arabia in the past. Uh, this isn't uh, all that new. Um, the you know, the, the, the rivalry has, has gone up and down and intensified and de-intensified and for various reasons, giving the leadership and uh, changes in leadership in each country and other things that have been going on. I think since uh, Mohammed bin Salman really started running the show, we've seen uh, an added degree of aggressiveness and risk-taking on, on the part of the Saudi regime. And maybe now um, he realizes uh, uh, there's a reason to start dialing it back. So, so there, is, there is some reason for optimism. So I'm going to end with one last question. This is from Ambassador Harriet Isom, who is out in Pendleton, a uh, former board member of ours. Um, as we think about stick, carrot, currency, and the baby <clears throat> steps toward an improved diplomacy, what about something like the prisoner exchange that the Iranians have appeared to offer? Yeah, thank you for that question. I, I had intended to uh, mention that as a caveat to my uh, gloomy overall um, uh, prognosis for the next few months. Yes, that's the one channel where I think we might see some, some positive developments. We've already had the one exchange that involved the graduate student from Princeton, uh, which was the, the person of ours that we got back. Uh, now there apparently are discussions involving um, perhaps another one-for-one -one exchange where the, the Iranian is this professor who, uh, uh, whose particular status vis-a-vis um, uh, -vis ICE seems to be a subject of uh, dispute in the press. But uh, yes, um, that's a real possibility. And, and I think it's, it's also, I, I don't know how much secondary good it would do in terms of really breaking the ice and trying to de-escalate some of the other tensions. It would be good, obviously, in its own right, in, in terms of getting the freedom of people who should be free and are unjustly incarcerated. It's also one area where I think uh, all of us on this side, however much we might disagree about uh, not only Iranian policy, but the nature of what Iran does and does not do, uh, 
uh, is that it is unjust uh, for the Iranian regime to hold as bargaining chips or for whatever other reason, um, American nationals, and most of these people we're talking about are dual nationals and the Iranians don't recognize dual citizenship, but from our point of view, they're Americans, uh, unjustly incarcerated on trumped up charges about espionage or something else. That is really wrong. And to the extent that um, deals can be reached that undoes some of that and gets some of these people their freedom, uh, that would not only be good in its own right, but uh, would be uh, a basis for wider optimism. That's wonderful. Thank uh, Dr. Pillar, I want to thank you a lot. I'm going to turn things back over to, uh, to Derek. Uh, for anyone who is participating in the talk, I posted links to the Iran Project. You can find out more about um, a, a Wikipedia page on the Iran deal. Um, I'd like to thank all of you for being here and engaging with what is a very, very, as I said earlier, a complex weft and warp that is not a recent piece of history, but has a long track record of um, understanding attached to it. So Derek, it is all yours to take us out. Thank you everyone. Uh, and thanks so much for joining us and for supporting World Oregon. And if you're not a member, we encourage you to go to worldoregon.org to become a member. Dr. I wanna highlight a couple upcoming programs we have. part rising up for human discussion group we have a new program added on international trade in COVID-19 that's Tuesday in the noon hour and then uh, Wednesday in the noon hour we have a higher ed panel uh, on talking about how 19 and on June 3rd we've added a program with an Atlantic Council expert on policy planning and foresight. Uh, again, Dr. Pillar, thank you for your expertise. Thank you to the RAND Project. And thank you all of us, all of you out there uh, for joining us here today. It's an honor to have you with us.